of being a law student which are more in the context of being a student per se and developing yourself as as an individual which would be things like quizzing or debating or theater writing art music sports many other things that you can do these were the things that people did back in my time and these are the more linear more yeah. traditional sort of extracurricular sort of extracurricular there is some echo i can hear myself can everyone else please go on mute yeah then you come down to your experience which would be things like where you've interned um what sort of you know for instance other than internships what sort of uh, you know are you positions or blog writing or something of that sort that you've done which again is a reflection of the stream that you're choosing and it's also to a large extent another parameter to assess you such as academics because you know if you've done internships at say a uh, couple of top tier law firms in a similar practice area and you go to the fifth top tier one after you've done the four they have a parameter to pick you up on saying okay yes this kid has gone to four uh, law firms where he's done the same thing he might be good doing it here as well certifications and affiliations is something which would be perhaps not too relevant in the first two years for most people but as you go along there are a lot of things that are happening in the knowledge market right now and back in my day there was a service provider called mylaw which actually started off their courses at nalsar as a trial and everyone in nalsar was allowed to subscribe for free back in february 2013 there is a lot of certification that is available on the internet not all of it is legitimate but a lot of it is so that again i think typifies the sort of law school experience that you're going to have where there are no barriers to knowledge anymore and covid has forced all of us to go via that route now so that again is a route that you would want to follow you know look at what is available on the internet in terms of knowledge growth in terms of uh, learning and then subscribe to those things a lot of those are paid for a lot of those are free depending on how you want to go about it you can always pick up some certification along the way that helps in again building up a larger universe for you and it also helps in showcasing interest and not just a, not just so you know a sort of passing love affair with each particular subject but a genuine commitment to it your talents and mm-hmm. sorry manju go ahead Yeah. Uh, so just just a second. So uh, just to add on to what Anjana is saying, uh, when you do pick up courses off the internet, or when you want to, they do a certain something. Don't always be scared of. Oh, what if I do something that does not fit with my previous mold? Will that look like I'm trying to waver? Uh, I don't think you guys should be worried about that because I don't think anybody on the outside world expects you to have everything sorted out or figured out in your five years. I think treat the college a little bit like. Treat the college a little bit like a buffet, not really a place where you have to dig into the main course. Just ensure you try out everything there is, and you will always figure something out. Perhaps after your fifth year, perhaps after your fourth year, but I think important that it is important that you try everything out because that in itself shows that you're willing to really venture out and try something new, and you are someone that's interested in the field as opposed to interested in a particular area of law, which I believe might be a little more important for. a law student who is expected to learn on the job when they go and not someone that comes with a lot of knowledge when they are hired or when they start off the job so your willingness to learn is a huge asset right and if you can you, and there are ways to express it as anjana said so don't ever uh, you know be shy of trying something new even if it's a course that you think is completely incongruent to something that you've done in the past that's completely yeah 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 No, I I echo that sentiment entirely. Don't be afraid of of doing different things, doing new things, and doing things that are outside of your comfort zone. Because roundedness is something which is getting more and more, you know, desired. And we will come to that actually. Point three has something very specific on that. Now, the last two components are your talents and skills. Some of you may be musicians. Some of you may be very good at sports. Some of you may be very natural theater people. Some of you may Do vlogging really well. Some of you may become YouTube personalities. 
some of you may be talentless the way I am. So it doesn't really, you know, I mean, if you have it, please go ahead and put it down and make it part of your profile. Because again, as I said, now the expectation of both the employer and the world for lawyers is that you will not be a straight jacketed, you know, dig your nose into books sort of a person. There's a lot of emphasis on on people's skills, on being able to carry a conversation, on being able to fit into a team. And the more and more we progress, particularly again in a post-COVID world, the thrust on employability is not just going to be skill set. A lot of people can now bring a skill set to the table. But you also have to bring a certain people element to it. So your talents and skills are something which an employer is going to look at and is going to be impressed by. And perhaps that is going to swing some sort of employment your way. The last bit is causes you associate with. Now, this is something which I think has become more relevant, you know, much after I graduated, because when I graduated, things were more straightforward. There wasn't, um, people weren't too interested in something like this. But again, I think with with the advent of social media and with the advent of a lot of information out there, people have become quite sensitive to the idea that someone might come with a certain level of activism towards a particular cause. It could be environment, it could be gender equality, it could be um, sexual orientation activism, it could be many, many things. And employers are getting more and more pressurized, and I use the word pressurized not in a negative context, uh, pressurized to to be diverse, to appreciate diversity, and to also exhibit the fact that they they're a good place to work at for everyone, not just for a Hindu upper caste male or a white man in any other part of the world. So the causes you associate with are actually quite significant now to what sort of profile you're showcasing. So don't be afraid of don't put it down on paper. Obviously, don't write it on your CV that this is what I care about. But in conversation, you can always bring it up that, you know, this is something that I associate with, I'm very passionate about, and I would want to go further with advocacy on this point on the side whilst I work with you. So that was on what are the components of a profile. Now, why are we talking about this? Why is this relevant for all of you on this call today? Your profile is somewhat what you take out of law school. What has law school done for you in the period between 18 to 23 or 19 to 24, whatever it may be? Um, how have your five years panned out? What have you picked up on the way? What is the output? That is the profile that we're talking about. How will you approach the world outside of Nalsar when you get out of there? And it's really important to to take something out of those five years, to build on yourself as a person and to build on your skill set as a lawyer, to also build on your personality and the th things that you can exhibit as part of you. They're very important again from, I think not just from a traditional job perspective, it's not just to say that, you know, dear Alan Novri or dear Amar Chand, here's my CV, uh, these are the 30 things that I've done in law school. These are the 20 moves I participated in. That's all well and good. But what it's also doing now, the idea of a profile, is that it's going across just your traditional job applications or your traditional CV on paper. When you're making an LLM application, things are not as straightforward anymore. A Harvard Law School may not be that worried about your grades, but they really want to see if you'll be a good fit. If tomorrow, 10 years down the line, will Harvard be proud to call you an alumnus or an alumna? When you're networking, and networking is majorly, majorly important in our profession, no matter which side you're on. It's important that you are not someone who's boring. It's not, you're not someone who can't carry a conversation. You're not someone who can only talk about, by the way, this new case came out, Supreme Court said this, or SEBI's come out with this new regulation, blah, blah, blah. You should have the ability to carry a conversation. You should have the ability to face people who are who may or may not be lawyers. Because now a lot of assessment of you within a career or even in non-career track method is going to be premised on how well you're able to 
engage with people. We can't work in silos anymore because the world has become that much connected and there's there's a lot of cheek by jowl working in law circles. You work with people majority of the time, you spend lesser time with your family than you spend with your colleagues. So it's important that you have a profile which defines what sort of person you are and you build relationships on that basis. And I think the last thing I would say is many of you might be, you know, aiming to go into the civil service, wanting to do the UPSC route. Now, in your UPSC interview, there will be a lot of questions outside of all the mugging that you've done. There will be questions on, you know, what sort of things are you interested in? There might be the spot IQ tests that you have. There might be questions on, you know, so you say that you did this thing. How did it help you? What has it achieved for you? How did you approach it? And that sort of thing. So it's important that you you don't treat your profile as a unidimensional profile. The last point in that, which is what we've put down as 3C, is where we're headed in the notion of a career. Now, all of us would have seen our parents, you know, whether they're um, in the government or they're in private service or they're business people, having largely a very linear, straightforward career track. You know, my, uh, for instance, my father did 32 years in his job. That was his first and last job. My mother switched jobs only once in, a, again, a career of 30 odd years by now. Whereas I have already switched jobs twice over. So the idea of a linear career track is becoming more and more irrelevant as we enter and as we progress to 21st century. So Harvard Business Review came out with a very interesting article. The link is over there. If you want to look it up, which is on the fact that everyone now should have two careers. One is your traditional track career, which is how you feed yourself. And the other is something that you're actually interested in, something that you want to, you know, um, something that you're passionate about. So when we spoke about causes you associate with, you could be a law firm lawyer by day and you could be an activist by night. You could be a lawyer by day, you could be an author by night. You could do the reverse also for that matter, once you've got your law degree in. So when you're approaching yourself and when you're approaching your profile, your CV, as we're calling it, don't, don't make the mistake of thinking that the world has not moved since many years ago and it's all going to be nice and cute and you will enter a job and you will leave it at 60, 65. That's not really how the world's working anymore. With the advent of the gig economy again, what is happening is that whatever you offer in terms of a service as a lawyer is getting more and more commoditized. It's becoming more and more, uh, you know, sort of, I don't know the exact word for it, but let's say it's it's entering a phase of you offer a very, you know, bespoke service, or you can offer a very assembly line sort of service. But the way people are approaching lawyering now is very different from, say, 20 years ago. So now do think of what else drives you. What is it outside of Nalsar? If you close your eyes and you were to think of 20 years down the line, I want to be known for X. It could be anything at all. It could actually be a scientific discovery, if you like. Do stress on that, do think about that, because we are not now in a world where you go to work, come back from work, retire and die. Um, Manju, anything you wanted to add? Yeah, so yeah. just a couple of things. Uh, so whenever, I think when you want to look at how you develop as in, you know, in sort of like an all rounded manner, I think it's important that, you know, you let yourself really sort of find yourself in law school because that happened with me, to be very frank. I mean, I came in as what, an 18 year old person to law school, but I think a lot of interest that I had changed over five years. I didn't know a lot about video games. I had a very good, I mean, I have a, a very good friend picked up something called Dota and I know all about it right now. And I mean, I couldn't be happier for it because it's one of the most fun things I've discovered through law school and law school gives you that opportunity. So it's important you treat it like a free fall and see where it takes you. And that's just one example. There are a lot of activities that happen 
in Nalsar, in Hyderabad, that you can always be a part of, always, uh, you know, join and very uh, few things to name. I mean, I was on the organizing committee for, say, debates or moots or something, and I happened to meet some of the nicest, you know, people that are were, that were coming in from other colleges, for instance, some people whom I'm still in touch with even today. So a lot of these opportunities will also help you find out what you're really good at in terms of whether you're really good at organizing something. So you can think of that as a as something that you would want to take up later. Or for instance, I somehow just decided to do uh, fest decor some in fifth year because that's something fifth years do. And that was also a lot of fun. I mean, art was therapeutic in its own way. So don't, uh, you know, don't have a set idea of what is allowed or what is not allowed in law school. Let yourself experiment with all that is available because it will add value in one way or the other to how you shape yourself over five years. I think that's pretty important. And, you know, you will always find people who are interested in similar things in law school. But what is even more striking is find someone that has a completely opposite view of something that you feel very strongly about and talking with them somehow makes for the most interesting discussions. So don't ever feel scared to engage with an opposite point of view. Trust me, you have a lot to gain there than to lose. And that the same holds for even say different subjects. Uh, in first and second year, I didn't think I could really do well with a lot of RC subjects because I didn't come from a uh, I didn't come from a you know a social science background. I studied science until class 12. So I was really scared to take those up, but I think I found my flair in those particular subjects some, sometime over third and fourth year. So don't be scared to experiment. Just ensure that you treat this like a free fall. Give it a shot. You will only find out later that you're thankful for it. Yeah, just to add to that, um, so I was quite shit at Fest Decor, so I never managed to do any of the nice things. I did dance at Avad Magad in my first year out of coercion and fifth year out of will. But that was largely my my sense of skill development. But no, just to add, I think um, she's absolutely right. You know, don't don't treat law school as a as a very straight jacketed game of Pac-Man where you know exactly where you're going. You know, treat it more like a, a journey, and it's important you do that because you know if any of you, I haven't been to the girls' hostel um, other than one time. But if any of you who live in, say, BH1, for example, you would have seen a lot of emotional stuff written about Nalsar and how life has been uh, across, you know, all the hostels. That's all. It's not wisdom of the ages. It is wisdom that you discover one day before you're leaving Nalsar. And the reason why it's all there is because everyone charted their own journey. They didn't realize they were going along a journey. They just thought they were doing five years in a place and then getting out. And this is truer for my generation and the generation before me. Because <clears throat> it was a much shittier place back then. And there was very little access to the city. There was pretty much nothing around. That monstrosity across the road didn't exist. Um, Shamir Pet had not undergone a lot of construction. So we treated Nalsar as our universe. It was both positive and negative. The positive side of it was that you had a lot of opportunity to learn from people lot of opportunity to engage in things which you never thought you'd do. You know, you would never ever think that I'll probably just, you know, I'll be the lead batsman for Courtyard Premier League. I don't know if any of you still do that, but we used to do that. And uh, and I became that. So so give it give it the ability to surprise you and don't don't be too linear on your path. Um, can we move on the word doc? Perfect. Okay, so now I think this is the part which perhaps people who are relatively junior are more interested in, which is where do we intern? And also, I don't know if they still have the document, but back in the day there was there was proper guidance on where you intern. So first year used to be something called a library internship. Second year was. Uh, Second year was an NGO, third year was high court, I think, fourth year was Supreme Court, fifth year was law firm. Obviously, that model is extremely outdated. Now, in the first three years, you have a lot of ability to experiment. You know, if you're if you're a first year, you're very green behind your ears. You're a kid, effectively. And I don't say that again in a patronizing way. What I mean is that I wish I was where you are, because then I would have taken a very different journey through law school. Um, I think you have the ability to 
to go to say a trial court without much consequence without worrying too much about oh my god whether i'm whether i'm going to get a job out of this or not or is this like a waste of my time you don't need to worry about that when you're in your first three years honestly you can experiment you can see you can go to a trial court and find it very very appealing you can find it entirely something you don't want to do you can go to the high court you can go to the supreme court when you go to the supreme court you can see senior counsel you can see a lot of your nalsar seniors running behind them as juniors you can see slightly more senior nalsar people running their own practices you can feel absolutely inspired by it and decide that this is what you want to do you can go to think tanks you can go to vidhi where manju works you can go to say um, brookings or prs plf there are a lot of these think tanks that operate between law and other disciplines and if that's the thing that appeals to you then those are great places to intern at you get a very good idea of what it is to lies on notions of policy what it is to speak to the government and engage with them so sort to of make them see sense in certain things a lot of people who are very set on the fact that they want a corporate life can go to smaller law firms where you may not be looking at them as your ultimate employment goal but those are great stepping stones to learn because smaller law firms more specialized firms for instance say anand anand and kimani which does ipr or uh, take uh, say link legal which is very very big with projects and infrastructure these are great places to pick up skills at they great places to learn at because they'll give you a lot more responsibility than your tier 1 firms do so you can go there in your second year third year learn a lot get a lot of first hand experience and then leverage that when you reach your fourth and fifth year this is obviously not <clears throat> excuse me this is obviously not an exhaustive list it is a list which is indicative again due to my being slightly aged on this call as opposed to the rest of you this is what things were like in my time i think the only thing i've added to this list is think tanks because people usually only had the first second fourth and fifth options back in the day but this is not exhaustive at all you can choose to intern with with people that are entirely out of this setup i've had batchmates who did not intern but who left law school and then say for instance joined a fashion designer as an executive assistant nothing to do with the law joined an ad agency joined a filmmaking course lots of lots of different experimenting that people did post law school that is something which i think now you can also do through your internship course and coming to your fourth and fifth year i think this is when for a lot of you who want to go to want to go to a definite career path and don't want to experiment too much this is the space where you start to go across the employment line where you start thinking about okay now i've done 3 years i have a fair idea of where i want to land up by the end of my course so let me go in turn at say let me apply for vacation schemes to willing leaders or an arun and overy or a herbert smith to the much junior people on this call these are all law firms headquartered in england they're all top law firms in the world you can in turn say in singapore with a firm or hong kong or if you're fairly wealthy you can also go to the us and intern you can intern with your indian firms of course and there's a more institutionalized process for that which is your icc in your fourth year but and then you can go to lawyers who you know you might have interned with or you might want to actually join after law school so for instance you might have found an advocate on record who you think will suit you you might go work with them for a longer time you might do repeat internships with them till you're comfortable with their office and the chambers a lot of us did clerkships in our fifth year in the supreme court where you get your month long a month and a half long clerkship i clerked with justice deepak mishra who about 4 years after my clerkship became the chief justice uh, a lot of my batchmates and a lot of seniors and juniors used to clerk in the supreme court for a month uh, in the fifth year because we'd already got our jobs so this was perhaps the you know it was it was the last bit of interning we were doing it was a very interesting internship but a lot of you might also look at a clerkship internship towards a longer clerkship commitment which is your one year or two year clerkship say i don't know if many of you know karan gupta from the 2018 batch 
who clerked with Justice uh, Chandrachur for two years. And that, of course, you know, it, it's a great stepping stone towards the legal world. That's also something you can look at when you're interning. If you've done a couple of think tanks and you find some think tank which works for you. So, for instance, if you're someone who's very interested in energy policy, you might go to Terry. I forgot the full form. But one of my batchmates used to work there. Uh, he then went for his uh, master's in public ad, public policy degree at Fletcher for two years. And then came back and joined Terry because that's how much he liked what he was doing over there. You can go to a more, I would say, sector neutral think tank as well, which has its own sectoral divisions. So for instance, Vidhi has a corporate law vertical that I know about. Mm, if you are interested in corporate law policy but not practice, that's a great place to go at again. So in your fourth and fifth year, I think, I think where we're driving at is that you, you may not have a perfect picture in front of you. You may not have an ideal self-portrait, but you will have some broad sketches of what has attracted to you, oh, I'm sorry, what has attracted you um, over the past three years. And where do you see yourself moving? I won't say running towards, but I would definitely say moving because most of us had some idea of where we're going by the end of three years. All of this comes captured with the fact that if you don't know, don't worry about it. And the last bit, which is you could not want to do any of this, could enter law school simply to become a civil servant, which is what two of my very, very close friends did. They both entered law school. Actually, one of them didn't know it then. One of them entered straight out saying, I want to be an IS officer. I'm very clear on that. He did his internships the way the rest of us did. But he spent fifth year studying, preparing, reading, um, and he made it to the IS on his first attempt, as did another one. And uh, I think, again, if you, after three years, realize that you know, you're in the wrong course, you don't want to do this, and you want to take any competitive examination, say CAT or UPSC or Judiciary, or I don't know what the entrance test for NIFT is called, or you want to say enter the army through the CDS process, you can spend time doing that as well. There's, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. That's the beauty of the degree that you're entering or you've entered, which is that it does not require you to become a lawyer at the end of the day. You can leave all of this and you can plan law school to not be a lawyer at the end of the day as well. Um, so yeah, that was all I had on four. Manju will add. So, so uh, I'm just going to take you through how I went about my internships because, I mean, I never really planned around how I wanted to do it. So in the first year, I went back to doing theater, which I did for a year before joining law school itself. And um, I did it for a month and I was like, okay, I'm back in law school now, so maybe I should uh, try a more serious internship in my second, uh, you know, after my second semester. But funnily, life has a way of coming around in like a circle because fifth year in college, at least, this was two years ago, there was a play that was hosted by National School of Drama, I remember. And I don't think, I mean, and I was in that play and I don't think I've ever regretted a decision as much as quitting theater, uh, as much as that I have about quitting theater. It's at least something that I want to keep going on at the side. And I think Nalzad made me realize that all the more. The point being that you don't really have to give up something to be in law school. And I think I learned that a little bit the hard way uh, at law school, because to be very honest, the way our curriculum is designed is that if you are doing your assignments, readings, and completing everything else on time, it gives you plenty of time on the side to really do things that you, you are passionate about. And where you might be a little unsure is really trying to put your finger on that passion itself. And that's where you really got to experiment. If I'm saying. Maybe to try a couple of research assistantships, because those are a great way to really invest your time into something, dig deep into something, figure out if you really like it or not. If you don't, then move on to the next thing. Nothing that you learn ever goes to the waste because if you ever go for, an, if a, for a research assistantship or even a move for that matter in an area that you're not very interested about, you will learn how to write, you will learn how to research, you will learn how to really move around uh, websites like Manupatra, SCC, all of which are very, very important, even as skill sets that you would perhaps take with you to your work. So all of these things really add up in some way or the other. So just don't be scared of trying an internship that you think is not very, you know, unidimensional or linear in what is what law school generally understands it to be. That's one. 
Second, when you're looking at internships generally, uh, I would suggest that do one internship a year. I mean, I sort of took this as a something. I sort of took this as an on an experimental thing where I would try and do at least one internship or one research assistantship or something in an entire year. Spend one month in something I had absolutely no idea about, and I think it. it on these internships that I've managed to learn a fair bit too. I just wanted to really see what that area held for me or what it really meant to just go and do something uh, in an area that I have no interest about. And I think that helped me a fair bit because I just saw what it was to look at a field without the lens, I mean, without the legal lens and really see how a lay person sees it or really see it how, say, a business person sees it. And that actually adds a huge perspective in terms of how you as a lawyer also would also want to look at that particular field. I did that with a chartered accountant, for instance. Uh, in at the end of my third year, I didn't feel like doing a corp a firm internship. I I was fairly interested in tax, but I didn't like the I didn't like really I didn't really like what tax lawyers did because I felt like a lot of the work that they did uh, required the skill set of a chartered accountant. So I thought, why not? Let me just intern with a chartered accountant. And man, do they really know their stuff in and out? And that really surprised me, right? Like I really I, that's something I really wanted to. Um, experience to see what the difference was between what a tax lawyer does and a CA did. So I decided to do an internship with the chartered accountant. And it pays off in really small ways because I remember I was right, I was helping someone write a, a handbook on international tax. And a lot of what I learned in terms of accounting standards in my CA internship sort of paid off. So it's not unusual for this to happen. So try and attack something that you're not very familiar with or something that you're familiar with but want to step outside your comfort zone of doing that generally helps a fair bit. In terms of specifically looking at internships in your fourth and fifth year, um, yes, it would be great if all of us really knew where we were even moving towards by the end of third year. But some of us, like I did, I had no idea. Even until the end of fourth year, I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm going to figure it out. I mean, there are X, Y things that I know I'm good at, X, Y, Z, A, B, C things I know I'm really terrible at. So, you know, I will eventually pick something that that will suit me. That's where I really, you know, sort of went ahead with. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that's an approach that might work for everyone or if currently the market is also somewhere, you know, you have that sort of a leeway to really experiment around a lot and then figure out what you want to do. But what I'm trying to really say at the end of this is it's okay even if at the end of third year or fourth year you feel like you haven't figured out where you really want to be because, as I said, we're all, what, 20 by the time we're in third year or fourth year? And I don't think anybody expects you to really know by 2021 that, you know, where you really want to be. I mean, I graduated last year. I still don't know if this is where I will stick around for the next year to come. And that's okay. The point is, don't get scared if you think you don't know where you want to be. It's important that you keep trying to figure out what you want to because that will eventually lead you somewhere. And take that as a matter of assurance because you will at least eventually figure out what you're not good at or what you don't want to do and then that itself will help you a lot in the elimination so just keeping at it i think is a lot more important than trying to figure out an area of it. taste everything that you get do all sorts of internships whether it is with a clerk or whether you want to go for a clerk because that has its own benefits whether you want to be with a think tank you want to i mean i know a friend that uh, volunteered to do street plays for animal shelters and tried to get in the legal angle as to why you know, you're not supposed to do X, Y, Z things with animals. And that was that that's the component that she added in her internship with an animal rights organization. You can always find different ways to express your interest. That doesn't have to be through behind the computer doing legal research per se. But just keep at it and you will eventually find out where you want to end up. Uh, can we just uh, go forward on the Word doc? Yeah, so in terms of, uh, I think, co-curriculars, which is what uh, we initially touched on when we were doing the introduction. Now, we've, again, listed out certain things which are more traditional, which are things that everyone at some point in law school tries to do or has done. Mooting is obviously the the most obvious uh, co-curricular that you can pick. And I say that not because, because both Manju and I have done it. I say it because 
it is perhaps the most legal activity that comes out of of being in law school and mooting i think has an unfair advantage in terms of you know in terms of your profile because people tend to think it does a lot for you in terms of your cv let me dispel that notion right here right now it doesn't it's a great activity i absolutely loved mooting and i have i would still count a particular day as a mooter as my best day in alsar after nearly 10 years of that day happening and that happened abroad it was it was, a, it was an excellent experience that i had and that opened a lot of doors you know honestly i and i say this with all humility i was the first person in my batch to get a job with a law firm called ashurst in the united kingdom and then i got one right after with link leaders which is also in the uk and both of them swung very very heavily because of my recent mooting experience which was international it added to my profile in a way that nothing else that i did in law school did honestly that said today 7 years after graduating if someone were to ask me you know is mooting the only thing that you are proud of is mooting the only thing that swung things your way the answer honestly would be no well there was a lot that i did in law school across all of these components some of them i did well some of them i didn't for instance i flunked the i just see a editorial test in my second year and then i never wrote an editorial test after that because i realized i'm not good at it which is perfectly fine for everyone to realize with any of the options listed here some people don't enjoy the process of mooting because it involves public speaking which freaks a lot of us out used to freak me out a lot still does i'm absolutely nervous right now for instance um for some people it could be that you are an excellent writer you publish a lot and that again is a very very legal activity so to speak it adds to your profile a lot particularly if you're looking at an academic career at the end of it editorial boards are great because you engage you engage with people you engage with with you know law and with pieces of law and pieces of literature that you may never have engaged with you learn a lot through the process being on an editorial board although i don't know it first hand so i will i will defer to manju on this if she was on one is that uh, it gives you a very different experience from from work that you are doing in the sense that it's not as if i did a moot or i wrote a paper it's a very collaborative effort into putting out a quality product at the end of it it is a lot of sleepless nights because i was in a relationship with someone who was on two headboards at the same time in nasar and she had an absolute wreckage of a time there was a semester where she barely slept because of this but at the same time what came out of it was a very well informed very confident someone who understood the idea of publishing really really well and i think that added to her ability to be a lawyer ra positions is something which actually developed after i left law school as did blog outreach and participation there were blogs back in the day but both of these were not were not mainstream if someone did these we would we wouldn't see it as as a very mainstream co curricular activity and it's great that they have become mainstream because i think ra ship again is an excellent way of educating yourself in a particular space as does you know writing a blog for instance if any of you follow the india cop law blog you have a lot of people who are third fourth years across law schools writing some phenomenal stuff on on what's come out you know and none of us back in my time were that were that good at understanding things all of us as good as we are now and that's all debatable if you talk to my boss um you all of us learned a lot of analysis a lot of lot of lawyering so to speak a lot of ability to think clearly as we went out of law school and as we picked up on the job but when i see these blog articles i realize that the quality of a law student has increased so much and it's very heartening to see nasar over there so this is a this is a very very good opportunity to build a profile again when you write because writing puts makes you think makes you clarify makes you understand a sentence can be written in 10 different ways and you through process of elimination will pick up the best way so when you're writing your third article you will not have to do those 10 different ways you'll be an effective legal writer by the time you reach the third one 
certifications is uh, is something again which i think we initially touched upon which is look at what is on offer you know across the world in terms of learning opportunities and do engage with them as well i know that the the manner in which nazar is done now has changed because i only saw it in my fifth year which was your tutorial system and your classes in the afternoon we had a much more you know we had a lighter college life because we went to class at 9 and came out at 140 and then the day was entirely yours and we all practically just wasted that day but there was a lot of opportunity that we could have explored and with with what is happening with knowledge development right now in the world you have a lot of opportunity to pick up things along the way to get certified in various skills it could be it could be something which you're interested in it could be something that you want to experiment with um there are certain things on the corporate side i'll talk about that at the end but that is something which again you can explore as a co curricular idea uh manju if you have anything yeah so uh, guys one thing that i think um i mean this is an this is a piece of advice that i got from a senior that i still look up to a lot and is something that he had to tell me that you know when you're looking at a lot of these co curricular activities don't look at them as uh flowers for your cv but just look at them as activities where you're going to take skill sets out of because i think that's the best piece of advice i've gotten the reason i really liked mooting was not because uh it, i mean yes the added public speaking and uh the i mean the fact that you get to stand and have a dialogue with someone that is perhaps a is someone who's at the peak of their career in that field is definitely exciting but what really comes out of it is a as anjania said a, a way to work around a way to collaborate with someone see both sides of the problem from different perspectives together and at the same time come out with a finished product which are your memos and then see that memo through in your oral round so all in all it teaches you people skills it teaches you writing skills it teaches you research skills and all of these skills are what you will take on as important uh, you will take with you as things that are important as opposed to how well or not well you did in a certain moment and whether that goes to you or not and this sort of ties back into what i was saying earlier that it does not matter whether this moot was in international law whether this was in i don't know commercial law whether this was in competition law it does not really matter what matters is that you, it taught you a little better to think like a lawyer it advanced your critical reasoning skills it advanced how you write how you speak how well you present yourself all of which will matter a lot later right and this was one of the reasons that and this was i mean these are things that you get asked in your interviews too for instance is uh if you're going in say for a policy internship particularly and the policy internship or a policy job or anything of that sort generally uh because most of us haven't had the opportunity to really explore think tanks a lot because i mean think tanks started becoming popular i think right around my third year or fourth year somewhere there so i never had a chance to intern with a policy uh, place so to speak you know in a core policy place yes i've done a research assistantship for someone who was at a policy organization but not a policy internship particularly and one thing i think that i saw was similar in what policy does vis-a-vis -vis what moot mootings do is that what what moots do is that um you try and solve problems at the end of the day in a moot you try and solve that at a legal forum in policy you try to anticipate what the problem can be and you try and solve that legislatively right so each of these each of these things give you those skills for instance if you're on the if you're an editorial board for something all of you that is that have been on editorial boards of that been that or is currently even on an editorial board currently trying to like piece a journal together you know how difficult it is to really reach out to people and show the stick to deadlines reach out for peer reviews reach out for blind reviews write emails to all of them answer a ton of doubts that they have and this constantly goes on without there being you know where without this sort of coming to an un coming to an end until you really have the published piece with you you will learn a lot about how to communicate in general which is again a huge soft skill that you will take out of this for your job later and so even when you're looking at co curricular activities i would suggest that look at them as what you would what you stand to gain from them in terms of how that will make you a better lawyer or someone that advances the skill sets that you already possess as opposed to what really what sort of a value it adds to your cv yes as anjania said i think having international moots or really good journal articles in your 
TV goes a long way in showing that you are good at what you do or that there is, it, it's merely evidence at the end of the day, right? I mean, it, it stands for the fact that you have excelled in something that you've done in the past, but it cannot really stand as a true test for what you can bring to the table once you are hired or once you are given that intern. And how well you excel after you have that foot in the door depends on what you really have picked up as skill sets through these activities. So ensure that there is always an emphasis to enjoy the process, enjoy the grind. If you don't like it, move to something else. Because I know for a lot of people, mooting, as Anjana said, can be quite frightening, not because you only will have to face, uh, you know, there will be a lot of public speaking involved, but also I've seen friendships fall apart because of moves in colleges. And that can be that uh, friendships fall apart or people just didn't, didn't just don't speak until fifth year and sometimes during a drunk, uh, uh, sometimes during a drunk fair, will this person goes to another person like, hey, sorry, listen, I know I didn't speak to you because of that mood, but you know, let's be friends. That, that's happened. I mean, we've all seen that happening, right? But if something doesn't work out for you, just switch to the next one. I mean, you don't really have to do a mood to come out as start of law school, but come out as a start out of law school. You can go on publishing, you can be on editorial boards. There are way too many ways to get recognized now, especially with everything going virtual with so many webinars, et cetera, happening. You can always get people to speak to, and you can always collaborate with different people to come up with, say, a collective blog together. It doesn't have to do anything with law, for instance. That will just, just, just help you, just help your entrepreneur skills, if not anything else. And there are various ways in which you can do this. So uh, that would be my two cents on it. Just ensure that you never look at these things as things you're doing for the sake of a CV, because that sort of diminishes the incentives that, you know, one has to excel in it. Uh, only if you really enjoy the process, stick with it. Don't let, uh, I know a lot of batchmates of mine told me that there is a certain amount of peer pressure involved in having to really moot in law school. That's not true. Uh, I mean, that is true in that there is definitely peer pressure, but no, that's not true in that you don't definitely have to moot in college to you know, come out successful. Pick up any activity that you think you like. Uh, ADR is something that's up and coming right now. ADR skills do help a lot in terms of how your everyday job scene is going to look like after, you know, you graduate because a lot of it becomes sweet talking, being very, uh, very professional with clients, ensuring that you put your points across in a succinct and very, you know, pleasant manner. All of all of these are soft skills that you will learn through competitions like this, and they, they will leave a far greater and deeper impact on how it shapes you as a person, as opposed to what it really does to your CV. Definitely, these things help you uh, get a foot in the door. Uh, as Anjanea said, you know, if you're applying for a firm that specializes in, say, competition law, and if you've had some experience in it, that goes a long way in them picking you over another candidate. But again, excelling there is a matter of how seriously you've taken your skill building in law school. So don't compromise the latter for the um, So just, uh, I think the rest of this is largely what's written over there. All of you can read it. I think most of it is self-explanatory. I just want to touch upon, I think Manju and I, that's been the theme of what we've spoken so far, is that there's no really one set formula for, for the activity that we're meant to tell you about today. Um, just again, just to go back into personal experience, I mooted, debated, I did both of those things. I published very little, no editorial boards. Uh, my internships were all over the place, honestly. I interned at courts, I interned with law firms, I interned with an NGO that worked on uh, IPR. I interned, uh, where else did I intern? I clerked with Justice Mishra. So I did a fair amount of, my law school experience was very bits and bobs here and there. None of my moods had anything to do with what I do now as, as, uh, uh, for my bread and butter. And as Manju remembers, when I was helping their team out with an international criminal law moot, I was absolutely shit at it because I didn't remember anything. Uh, so... I am going to call you out, Anjana. You were not shit at it. Come on. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't remember anything, to be fair. So I did moot out of... I, I will be honest about it. Yes, mooting happened a lot for us particularly my batch, because we were the first batch that came through CLAT. We were hyper competitive and everyone mooted out of some notion of we will end up losing out. Some of us ended up really enjoying doing what we did over there, uh, which included me. I absolutely loved mooting. I did about five of them um, and I surprisingly was good at them. 
so that was it typified a lot of my law school experience i never treated it as cv building back then but when i look at it now yes there was an element of cv building to it in comparison many of my batchmates did very very different things and a lot of us ended up at the same place you know so it's not as if as if where you end up is going to be determined solely by how you walk that path the walk could be entirely different you would still end up in the same place so don't again don't take any of what we talk about here in terms of oh i love doing this i love doing that because anjane said it or manju said it must be true and therefore we must also do it and end up putting ourselves in a place which we don't enjoy don't be miserable by the end of a moot if you're miserable by the end of a moot it's probably not what you want to do and there's nothing wrong with that in terms of people uh, you know fighting over and people losing friendships and um, things becoming bad for people that actually my batch achieved without even having to fight over moots we fought over other things so much that uh, <laughs> we quite hated each other by the end <clears throat> no that's not true we we still like each other a lot but uh, but a lot of what we did came out of peer pressure i will not lie on that so that is everything i think on this page we can move to the next one i'm also cognizant of the time so we might rush a little from here this manju will help you out with because my ability to cv write is very shit because i've been uh, quite fortunate to be employed by people without asking too many questions it's probably because i look so innocent but uh, manju is going to take up the cv writing part um so guys i'm just going to take you on through a brief primer on what a cv needs to look like um again as anjaneya said i didn't sit i mean uh, as anjaneya said i was also fortunate to have just one faced one interview my entire life so i'm not sure if this works everywhere but i have been on the other side where i've edited a bunch of cvs or been in a position where because it was a hiring spree and they usually take in the opinion of all teammates before they hire uh, someone i've been on the other end of looking at what people generally sign off on as a good cv or what my hr has usually signed off on as a good cv so I'm, all of this is just coming from that sort of experience and um again uh, i understand that the rcc and icc requires that you put your cv for law firm internships in a particular format i understand that there is a format for that i'll get to that later i would request that i mean if it's possible maybe we'd i would love to have a chat sometime with the rcc icc specifically to see if we can change that around a little bit because uh, i know that's a format that we have followed for a very long time that used to be how it was even 3 years ago it used to be how it was maybe 6 7 years ago too because when seniors have forwarded their cvs to me it looked exactly like that but how cvs are written today have changed a lot and i think it is important that CVs that go out of NALS are also reflect that standard. So we'll take that up separately if we want to have the ICC and RCC sort of change that bit. But again, let's see what if you are. Let's assume that this is for someone that's not applying for a set for a CV that has a set format, but is writing a CV by themselves to apply to a job or an internship, anything for that matter. Okay. So these are the basic components your CV has: your name, your contact details, and a brief introduction about yourself. Academic qualifications, experience, and internship, depending on whether you're switching jobs or you know, you're applying for an internship. Co-curriculars, extracurriculars, and references. Now there is no particular order. Preferably the first three. Please keep it that way. You can shift around your co-curriculars, extracurriculars to break them up into positions of responsibility, for instance, or uh talk about mooting in particular if that's something that you want your cv to stand out in it depends on how you would really want to sell this as a finished product at the end of the day right so these are the basic components just ensure that this is a checklist of sorts that you treat this as a checklist of sorts don't blindly go by this okay the second thing is that i've this is i think uh, something that i've noticed most juniors that i've uh, sort of helped around you know write a cv or help them apply for law internships um, internships for i've seen this particular trait that there is one set cv that people send out to everyone now i cannot emphasize how important it is for you to tailor make a cv guys you're not going to sell chicken wings to a vegetarian it's as simple as that you know who you are pitching to you really want to only sell what they're going to buy right at the end of the day ensure that your cv is tailor made for the position that you're applying for ensure read around what the requirements of that position is for instance if you are 
So there are 20 things that you may want to write on your CV, but ensure that you write things that matters to the person reviewing your CV from that end. Put yourself in their shoes. Ask them, ask yourself, if I saw X, Y, Z on the CV, would that make an impact in their decision on whether to take me or not? If your answer is yes, only then include it, right? So just ensure that your CV is tailor-made for uh, the specific position that may be a legal internship or a non-legal internship. If you're applying for a clerkship, the fact that you have written extensively on, say, constitutional law or some matters of procedural law might be more handy than the fact that you've had an excellent, uh, you know, run of corporate firm internships where you've had callbacks after callbacks because clerkships honestly couldn't care less about whether you've had a lot of callbacks or not. So it really depends on where you want to go. So chart out only that clear path on where you want to, uh, who you're pitching for and keep that in mind and then apply, uh, I mean, make your CV accordingly. The second tip is that ensure that your CV is always crisp, right? A crisp CV always has a way of standing up. So think of it this way, guys. I mean, I understand that, um, you know, there is, I mean, this is something that I've seen that a denser CV, I think, has comes with an understanding that there is so much that this person has to say. If they have so much to say, that means that they've maybe done a lot. So which means if they've done a lot, that means it's a great CV and they've used their law school life in a very lustrous manner. So in conclusion, a denser CV is a better CV. That's not always the case. Most HRs that are looking at your CV, and I've seen this happen with HRs, uh, with our HR and with him when they were trying to hire for uh, a particular team. And an HR doesn't usually spend more than two CVs on even when they're hiring people, and let alone in terms, right? Like more than two minutes. I mean, two minutes is what you think you can really grant yourself. And you have, you must, your, your CV must have the ability to really sell I mean, you must have the ability to really sell yourself in those two pages. I would say two pages at a, at the maximum, but I would say one page is where people, uh, one page is where I think most, you know, places are now looking at. One page usually must suffice. And one thing that I've noticed when uh, CVs are written in college is that you have a very linear way of writing it. There is the name that goes first, the academic qualifications, and then everything just goes one below the other and i see a lot of spatial like there's just a lot of place in the a4 sheet that just goes through waste if you can find a way to customize how you can make your cv really crisp by really reorienting where you want certain things to be just ensure that you even take a shot at that you will there will not be a single formula that works for everybody the reason i'm not even showing my cv here today is that i feel like this is a this is something that happened to me when i saw someone's cv i internally try and fit what I want to say in that particular mode, but that's wrong. You know, try out what works for you. Word, for instance, has great templates that you can sort of like experiment around and see if it works for you. See if something of that sort works for you, if you're able to convey everything in your, in those two pages. You don't always have to really flesh out everything that happened in every internship. That doesn't really get you anywhere. Just ensure that this is a highlight you're not really showing them a documentary. If you want to tell them on a trailer, this is how you would go. So ensure that your CV is largely aimed to me, largely aimed at that. Okay. The third thing is uh, take your references very, very seriously. And I cannot, I cannot tell you how important this becomes as you progress uh, in your career because who vouches for you is as important as where you graduate from sometimes, right? So uh, most places ask you for two references and two referees and they try and look at two areas of things generally when they ask you for uh, referees. One, whether uh, this person can vouch for your work ethic. And second, whether they can vouch for your subject area interest or experience or expertise. These are generally the two things that they try and look at. So ensure that when you're getting two referees, you're getting two people that have uh, that sort of can complement or can back up your claims in a complementary manner like they one needs to be someone that you've had extensive working experience with and has managed your has managed you so they can vouch for your work ethic and someone that has perhaps taught you a specific area that you are willing to that you're wishing to apply for say in masters or something so ensure that your referees are also slightly diverse so that uh, uh your you know whoever's ref whoever is taking a look at your cv gets 
everything out of those two references that they are looking at, right? And there is also a general understanding that you put a really fancy name on the CV that really helps you get through. But I've actually learned that's not the case. Just try and get someone to vouch for you who knows you well, not someone who's otherwise who otherwise looks great on paper but does not sort of really remember you. I mean, nothing's as horrible as putting a really great name on paper and you know, say the HR reaches out to them and that person on the other end goes like, yeah, I kind of remember her. I mean, you don't want that to be said about you. If you want to say you're putting someone there as a referee, this needs to be someone that really vouches for everything that you're claiming on your CV. Okay? So pick someone that you think or speak to someone beforehand that you think can vouch for a lot of things that, that is being said about you on the CV, right? The next thing is, uh, this is a pretty useful hack that I have uh, learned I think somewhere around the fifth year in law school that, you know, it, it helps to have a long form log that you periodically keep updating, right? And this is all the more important the more you progress in your career because firstly, five years is a pretty long time. You do so many things, the details of which start becoming hazy over time and they might prove useful somewhere at some point in your life. And But you don't really want to not remember them. So don't solely rely on your memory because that becomes a really shoddy way of going about CVs. So have a long document or a CV log where you document everything that you think is CV worthy, worthy over done in over an entire semester, right? So if you think that's a publication, if you think that's a moot, if you think that's anything, like write down details, for instance, as if it is a moot, what the problem was centered around, what was, what is, what was your groundbreaking idea or research that you came up with there? Uh, what is the literature around, what was the literature around that particular uh, around that particular problem at that given time did you do you think you added anything to the debate so ensure that you do an assessment of how you have uh, progressed over a particular academic co curricular or extracurricular activity and put down every detail in this log because it will prove to be very very useful later and where it is most useful is that it helps you stitch up a CV on very short notice and send it out. And you wouldn't have to think, uh, sit, da sit down and really scramble your brains to think, oh, what, what exactly did I do in that internship? It would have helped if I really remembered everything clearly. No, just have everything in one piece of document as you, and especially, you know, after you're out of law school, if you want to really apply for LLMs and a bunch of these things, what you did in law school and recalling them to every small detail becomes really, really relevant. So keeping this log of sorts and fifth years, I know you have tremendous amount of time, or time on your hands. So please invest in doing something of this sort. It really, really pays off at the end of the day. So have a long form CV and that helps you sort of bring out a short CV whenever required. The last one is get someone who's preferably not a peer or a senior to spend two minutes on every CV you want to send out. And this is by far, I think, the most important step. Because guys, remember when you send a CV out, it is not going to be an Alza person that's going to review it. A lot of things on your CV has contextual meaning attached to a lot of it. Because if I say that I, I got an O in a Siddharth Chauhan course, that would mean a lot to people from Nalza, but that wouldn't mean a lot to someone sitting outside. Now. Right. So you have to explain to them why that means so much. Say that, say, for instance, if you're applying to a policy internship, say that you assisted a certain professor in coming up with X, Y, Z things, and this was your project and this was your contribution. That is a better way to explain something. Right. So just think of it from an interviewer's perspective as to what you really want to convey. And that may not always come across very clearly when you are giving it a shot, because there is so much that's going on in your head, you will automatically assume that the way the CV is coming through to you will be the way that will come, in, it will come through to an external person who's reading it. But that's not always the case, right? So just spend, just get someone, get a friend that you had before law school or something, just call them up and ask them to look at it and ask them what they think of it. If everything that you want to stand out in your CV is standing out adequately. If not, then back to Chop Chop, get to re-editing re -editing it again. And uh, in this same regard, there's just one small thing that I think uh, that I forgot to put here, but I, I would sort of like to talk about is try to avoid using jargon. That's not just in your CVs, but even if you write emails, even if you write projects, any, any, anywhere for that matter, right? Try and avoid jargon because that's generally outside law school. I mean, uh, even in law school, I think these days it's just looked at as a bad practice for writing. Ensure that your writing is as simple and as crystal clear as it can be because clarity 
often trumps everything else if you can't explain something in the more in the most clear fashion to someone it often casts a doubt on whether you really know what you're trying to say so try and cut out the jargon uh keep your cv as simple as possible that helps you really ensure that you have a good cv yeah so this is about the cv anshay do you want to add something here no i think i think that's all uh, it's all excellent advice and i think everyone should make sure that you follow that on the jargon point i think yes please understand that look dense language is something we are meant to decipher we are not meant to make things worse you know statutes in india are particularly badly drafted and a lot of lawyering in india is actually premised on that so don't add to it don't uh, don't shit all over something which is already full of crap and when you are writing your cv you know for instance if you want to say that i did this thing just say it don't don't write stupid stuff like uh, you know i am keen to explore opportunities or stuff like that obviously you are that's why you're sending in a cv don't waste space on writing things which are which are patently obvious i'm saying that with as much harshness as i am because a lot of cv writing is now people have started thinking of it as some sort of uh, cheap salesmanship which it isn't meant to be it's meant to be a record of what you want to tell someone and you should treat it as such be crisp be clear don't <clears throat> go into unnecessary i think don't go into over detail also don't be like i did these 30 things while i was interning at please x no one cares i i would have lost interest after three honestly and that's giving you a lot of patience so anyway so that was that um that was all i had cuz uh, i agree with everything manju said now i think this is the last leg of this presentation and again i'm cognizant of time so we'll probably rush through this a little since we've already covered a lot of this um i used to quiz a lot in college i had a stable team in fact if you go to nals our website and you look for quizzing experiences there's a picture of me with two of my batchmates you probably not recognize me because i used to look much worse back in the day actually i still look as bad i just lost all my hair but um in terms of quizzing i think it was a great extracurricular because it helped me become a better lawyer also in in a weird way which is that it taught me how to how to think on my feet very very quickly it added to my mooting and that both of them together are to my lawyering even today it's one of the talents i have which i don't see in a lot of my colleagues which is the ability to think very clearly and to think on my feet come up with a quick solution debating is helpful again i think because it helps you clear up your mind helps you think in a logical rational manner in a way in which you can take points from the other side distill them come up with a counter give it back and that actually is a very underrated talent you know because a lot of us have a lot of mental fuzz particularly people who aren't naturally well organized it's great to pick up debating because it puts your mind in a for against column 0.1 0.2 0.3 0.4 0.5 0.6 which otherwise would just be haywire it really helps you do that bit of segregation in your head and that that will take you a very long way even if you don't end up as a lawyer at the end of the day exploring talents as manju said manju was involved in theater i was talentless so she was you know i mean she had a talent and she gave up on it for a little while but then she came back to it which i think is is a great thing and i think it's an important thing also because you have to realize that while the function of an indian law school unfortunately is to make you some sort of automaton you are human at the end of the day and some bit of that humanity also needs to be manifested into what you do for your own pleasure learning is when i say learning i don't mean learning as going to the library and picking up a book of a course that is going to be taught to you next year and trying to you know be some sort of napoleon and jumping the gun when i say learning i mean pick up something which ordinarily you would never do as an example in my second semester i was phenomenally bored i picked up uh, i had bought a book called learn urdu in 30 days and i taught myself how to read and write urdu and today it's it's not a saleable talent no one cares particularly with the last six years of government that we've had it's it's not a saleable talent at all 
But what it is, is it's something which gives me pleasure on a Sunday evening if I pick up a poetry book and I read a poem in the text I was written in. It's a talent you wouldn't ordinarily have, you wouldn't ordinarily, ordinarily explore, but law school gave me that opportunity. And it's a lifelong talent that you pick up. Do that, because you know, there are certain things you have to do for yourself in this process. A lot of law school is cold, rational thought. There is a lot of dehumanizing also of thought that happens more and more as you enter the lawyering world. You do not assess things the way you would at 18 with a kind art anymore. So it is important that you have some things which give you pleasure outside of what, what you do right now as academic and what you will do for a living in the future. Second point is, you know, we did not have things like Coursera back in the day or Udemy or Upgrad or many of the other uh, providers. I think Khan Academy just about started when we were graduating. And as I said, MyLaw was the first platform that we had where there was a course being offered. So for us, education meant a straight track record. You have your surprise tests, which are now abolished. You had your mid you had your end you had your projects. You did that, went back home, interned, came back, same thing on repeat, for five years, get out, get a degree, and get into a job. So we learned in the classroom. We learned very little outside the classroom, unless we were mooting or writing. Today, that has changed a lot. And the expectation on the other side has also changed a lot. And Amarchand back in 2012-13 did not care so much if you really brought anything more to the table. Today, if you're a candidate and there's a candidate from a much worse law school, you know, and they say that they have actually done these seven courses and the partner says, okay, tell me about this, tell me about that. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And they answer, well, no one's really going to care about the fact that you're from Nalsar. Nalsar does give you an advantage. It does give you 10 meters ahead in a race that you're running. And I hate to put it in those terms because that makes it very hyper competitive, just for purposes of illustration. But anyone can bridge that gap today. And the tag of a premier law school is becoming more and more irrelevant because lawyering and law school have very little to do with each other. So don't, don't, be, don't be too straight-jacketed in the idea of, I will learn in the classroom, I will do my four, five hours over there, and then I'm not going to do anything, because this is enough. You, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. There's nothing wrong with it. But think about it from a skill perspective. Think about it from a person perspective. And I'll give you an example. Right now, I'm doing a distance MBA over the next two years. I've already run the first semester, I have three more semesters to go. I am seven years into the profession. I am a, I'm one step away from partnership. There's no reason for me to do it specifically, but I'm doing it because I actually want to learn. And at some level, that is the mindset that, that is going to become more and more prevalent, which is that learning is a continuous process. And learning outside of the traditional set is now a skill that everyone's looking at. And what COVID has done, COVID has actually managed to precipitate that a lot. You know, it would have organically without COVID taken about, I would think about another five years by the time all of you would have just left law school to become the norm. But COVID has escalated everything. It's made the requirement to upskill, the requirement to reskill, and the requirement to to finish off, uh, sorry, to, to, you know, sort of not finish off your learning more important. The last bit is read not only the law, go to the social sciences section in the library, pick up books that you find, um, you know, read on things that interest you. For instance, if you're interested in corporate law, a lot of books that have been written about landmark transactions, about what goes on in boardrooms, about the tensions, about how lawyers step in, about some great people, um, you know, closing some phenomenal transactions, about how say the acquisition of Arcelor by Mittal happened, <clears throat> how Getty Oil was sold, how the financial crisis went down. All of that literature is very helpful in contextualizing the world that you, some of you will enter. Uh, can we just go to the last slide very quickly? Since I'm cognizant, we have a time limit.
is there a way i'm just asking the organizer is there a way to extend this by 10 15 minutes uh sushrut if you're on mute both of us i mean ajay and i can't hear you uh hey really sorry uh, i don't think it will get extended uh, as far as i know like it has a strict time limit so oh, okay we had assumed that it would so. okay in that case uh, what we'll do is i'm just going to quickly put in my personal email id here in the chat and if you want to reach me on anything that we put out over there do reach me i will very quickly just tell you i have listed two books over there the first one is more important uh please do not use websites such as libchain book cc or mobilism to download an illegal copy if you are unable to not download an illegal copy from libchain.com or libchain.ru libchain.is is also a website from where you can not download copies book cc is also a very good source of not downloading an illegal book mobilism is great if you have a kindle so the richard saskin book is a very very good book on what the future of lawyering is going to look like and what that means for you i am very sorry we don't have time for q and a so you have my email id uh, if you have any questions you can find both of us i guess on facebook or linkedin or wherever other than our email so thank you for hearing us out and if manju has anything to add she can do it very quickly uh just one last bit uh guys there is a word outside shamir pet i know a lot of my friends struggled with a lot of mental health and uh you know health issues generally over law school don't get bogged down by it reach out for help if you if you want to and i understand it's especially hard during covid given we all been cooped up so don't ignore your mental health through five years i mean that's a lot more valuable than you'd like to admit at this point in your life anjani and okay. manjushri i thank you both on behalf of the alumni cell for taking topic the session was a very informative one i must say usually the sessions on cv building are more focused towards building a cv specific for law firms uh, this webinar gave perspective to us as fields which are available after law school we hope to host you again in the future thank you so so much for taking out time for this no worries thank you um just one thing i'm cognizant that the session hasn't ended so do you want to just run the q and a until webex closes on us uh yeah i i think we can do this let's just try doing that let's just test it if it does shut then we can't do much but if anyone has any questions okay. still want to put it in the chat box okay i have i can only see one question so far which is from aryan shastri uh do you have any advice for people who are almost at the end of law school we already have jobs we'll be moving out of nalsa how do we build a profile cv after law school okay that is actually a great question uh, aryan in terms of where you're headed i think the answer will be a little more tailored so perhaps i can give an answer from a law firm perspective what you can do is you can alongside what you do in a, okay so you're joining tri legal that's great and uh, there's some clarity there uh, what you can do is you can explore the opportunity of qualifying in other jurisdictions so for example you can try qualifying into england and wales through an examination called the solicitors qualifying examination or qualification examination something like that it's a slightly expensive proposition but since you'll be in a law firm you will have some money to hold on to it's it's a way of upskilling it's a way of adding a skill or a uh, you know a, a sort of qualification a further selling point which helps you in showcasing that your that you have a strong lawyer profile other things that you can do is you can obviously as i said distance mbas are always an option because they help you in contextualizing your work i work in the capital markets team and a lot of what we do is business interface we speak to investment banks all the time but we are outside the discussions on 
you know how to approach investors what sort of valuation people are going to get because we're meant to be more the paperwork guys and more the legal advice guys you can change that you can be more interested in the idea of business and upskill on your law and business set through a supplementary degree or even through as we said coursera um new demi and all of these providers do a lot of courses that's how you build a profile outside of law school if you're in a law firm lastly i think you can always do the company secretaryship course alongside which is quite helpful in in giving an overall perspective on on lawyers approach or a compliance approach to businesses it's not something that people in tier one law firms typically do it's also some sort of skilling that people from lesser law schools or uh, smaller firms do in order to enter a bigger law firm or to compete with people like you but it's it's a great learning experience and it's it's a great skill to have because compliance and regulation and also to a large extent constant regulatory interface are becoming more and more important particularly in spaces that are very very regulated examples would be say the power sector or the banking and finance sector if you're entering a practice like that it's great to have a compliance perspective as well so those are some of the things those are obviously not um, you know they're not exhaustive in any way but they're all things that uh, that people have done so i have done a british qualification i'm doing a side course as well so those are things that you can explore there are many other things that people have done you can you can find out about them as well um there is a question from divyanshi which is that uh, sorry there was one question before that there's a question from samved how do we build a profile gear towards maybe an llm what do top universities look for in prospective students that actually is there's no straight forward answer to that the thing about an llm profile is academics is obviously important but beyond that uk universities don't care about work experience uk universities don't really care about uh, your internships they don't care about if you've done 10 years out of law school or you're fresh out of law school and i can say this with experience because i went to one uh, cambridge for instance my batch had people who were fresh graduates i was perhaps the person with the most work experience and they didn't care about my moods or anything at all they cared about what i wanted to do what sort of courses i wanted to pursue how i'd done academically and those kind of it us schools are very different for instance columbia is very very heavy on work ex they love people with law firm work ex because columbia does some phenomenal corporate law courses harvard is tempered it may swing one way or the other yale is looking for people who are looking to be- become academics and becoming you know and they have a very small class size so they pick people who they see promise in as an academic so there is no clear straightforward answer on how to build a profile towards an llm what i would say is have strong academics because that is going to be the core of your cv publish a lot because publication helps a lot in showcasing that you're geared towards higher studies and here there's another difference between the uk and us schools is that the us schools see an llm as some sort of skill building whereas uk schools see llm as a very traditional masters course something like an ma in history or something it does it's not meant to be a stepping stone it's just meant to be a further inquiry into why law is the way it is so i think publication and academics are perhaps the baseline but beyond that there is really no one set formula Uh, there's a question from Divyansh, which is: Is it true that corporate law firms suck the life out of you? If I want to do something else on the side, will working in a law firm allow me to do that? Um, on the first one, I would say they do. I will not be. I will not lie. They do take a lot out of you, but the reason for that is that you are a service provider. At the end of the day, someone is putting a lot of faith and money into your legal advice. and someone wants to achieve a particular result you're responsible for delivering it so yes it does take a fair amount of time for instance i have to work tonight and i'm reasonably senior in my organization but i still have to work tonight because that's what my client expects of me if you want to do something else on the side if for instance you want to do some sort of let's assume a startup on the side will you have time for it 
in your first two years perhaps slightly lesser but slowly slowly you start to pick up on how to manage your time even with the job that you have you can actually do something out of interest you can learn something you can attend classes and you can actually schedule your life around that law firms will not will not deny you the opportunity to to do things outside of them if that's the question you're asking uh there is a question from yashwant uh how are covering letters to be looked at in addition to tailoring cvs for each different internship i will let manju take that one this is not something i know right so uh covering letters are also it's sort of a pre pitch to your cv itself you are writing for a specific position to a specific person know reasonably uh, well who you are writing to within the organization a dear sir or a dear ma'am may not always look uh, great with like five email ids that you are seeking along with it so ensure that you know you are applying you first know who you are applying to second uh, also ensure that um, whatever are the points of your cv you want to highlight is there in your covering letter think of it as a very small primer don't write more than a couple of paragraphs i mean a couple of paragraphs other than the introduction etc i mean your name introducing yourself just write a couple of paragraphs on why you want to do this and why you think those uh, you are the best candidate for this keep it very simple that should take you through yeah i think everything on the chat box so if if no one has any further questions i think we're good so i'll give you guys about 30 or seconds to ask if you have anything else to ask if you don't you have email id and uh, do in, in my opinion read the suskin book it's important because it does sort of tell you what the future of law practice is going to look like and the last line if any of you have not understood till now is meant to encourage you to go to libgen book cc and mobilism to actually download an illegal copy because so copy you don't have access to oup and all of that so i have this great that are out to you sorry i have also for uh, just giving them another pirate source so i oh, have yeah. oh yeah, i don't know for, yeah, yeah oh you should really check this out it, it's pretty much a consolidation of libgen and all of that in like one place Quite nice. Okay. okay, and uh, I think generally, guys, just I would say that just remember that there is no set formula. Manju and I have had very different journeys through law school, and I could pick up any of my batchmates, and the answer would still be the same. I could pick up any of her batchmates, and perhaps the answer will largely be the same. Chart your own path. Don't be too bogged down by what others are doing. There will be moments where you will feel pressure. You will feel scared for yourself. And the only thing i would say much outside of law school and much outside of uh, you know the, the the realm of nalsa having spent more time out than in things will resolve themselves it's a tough time right now because of covid that particularly the senior batches are facing and i don't want to give you false hope But at the same time i also want to let you know that in a 50 year long or a 60 year long career that we will have as lawyers this is just a very small you know event so don't be too scared don't be too worried you belong to a great law school all of you have worked very hard to be where you are and all of you will continue to work very hard in the future so don't be scared don't be too disturbed if any of you want to reach out generally to have a chat on what you know what the future looks like i'm happy to take that discussion as well so thank you all for joining and for listening to us for this long we typically don't end up speaking for that much <laughs> but uh, but there was a lot to cover and uh, as i said you've got both our email ids in the chat uh, so do do send us questions if there's something you want to ask which you're not comfortable asking here if uh, you want references to books that you can read outside of law school which are related to transactions and business and funky tra- deals and the world crashing down do reach out i can give you a nice reading list for that and all the illegal websites that we have put out uh, 
you know don't download from there they all have all of these books over there so don't download from there yeah cool uh, Manu, so much. Much. No, no, that's it thanks a lot guys i just dropped in my email id uh, a bunch of you are still in touch with me for a bit various activities and generally otherwise too so in case i'm not available on email or i forget to reply on whatsapp which i normally do uh just ping me once more it's not that i don't want to reply to that i guess i forget sometimes so it's fine reach out to me on whatsapp uh or on email i will ensure that i get back thank you so so much for this session hope to host you again sometime on some other topic thanks a lot thank you thank you bye 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 see you once next bye